Hi, this is Dr. Christabel Yeo. If you are seeing patients who remain mysteriously unwell in the months after COVID infection, join me for Biocytical's Clinical Mastery, the post-viral syndrome, on June 8th, where I will cover the key relevant strategies in post-viral syndromes, including immunometabolism, endothelial dysfunction, and mast cell activation. Go to biocytical.com.au to register. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based integrative, functional, and complementary medicine. I'm Dr. Adrian Lopresti, and today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Professor Michael Burke. Michael Burke is an NHMRC Senior Principal Research Fellow and is Alfred Deakin Chair of Psychiatry at Deakin University and Barwon Health, where he heads IMPACT, the Institute for Mental and Physical Health and Clinical Translation. He has gathered an incredibly impressive list of awards over the course of his career, and he is listed by Thomas Reuters as amongst the world's most influential scientific minds. He has authored or co-authored over 1,300 papers on a wide variety of mental health topics, including how inflammation and oxidative stress affects mental health, and using N-acetylcysteine for the treatment of mental health disorders like bipolar disorder. It is a great privilege to have him with us today, where we'll talk about some of his amazing work. Welcome to FX Medicine, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Adrian, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to chat to you. So, Michael, I'm an avid follower of your work, and I know you've done a lot of work in the area of inflammation and mental health. Um, Can you tell me a bit about the relationship between inflammation and mental health and the area of immunopsychiatry? Absolutely. Um, This is now a very interesting and hot topical area. But 20, 30 years ago, um, this was an area that was treated with some skepticism. The idea that inflammation was present in mental health disorders, A, and B, that it had any impact on mental health disorders, was rather um, disbelieved. But what's happened in the last couple of decades is a substantial body of evidence has accumulated showing that depression, and for that matter, most other psychiatric disorders, are associated with increased levels of markers of inflammation. Yes. So uh, the problem, however, is that there are many people who meet diagnostic criteria for those illnesses who do not have markers of inflammation, and those markers of inflammation are positive in quite a diverse range of psychiatric disorders, as well as in many medical comorbidities, many of those comorbidities also being common in people with depression. So it's a mm-hmm. complicated area. Yeah, certainly the uh, that relationship between inflammation, mental health, and obviously there's also the relationship between inflammation and physical health disorders, cardiovascular disease, for example. So obviously the research kind of showed, there was research showing that there's a relationship between inflammation and mental health. Does that then necessarily mean that inflammation can cause depression or, or mental health disturbances or is it just purely a relationship? That is a really important point. Uh, I think probably the best evidence we've got that inflammation can cause depression comes from experimental studies where inflammatory cytokines are infused into volunteers. And that Mm -hmm. induces many of the signature features of depression. That's probably some of the very best uh, evidence that we have. There's also indirect evidence from conditions that are principally inflammatory, and almost every one of these is associated with an increased risk for depression. But it's a bit more complicated than that because many of the lifestyle risk factors for depression, so these are things like physical inactivity, low vitamin D, stress, uh, trauma, poor diet, all of these actually can increase inflammation. So that makes it a little bit Uh, unclear whether inflammation is the mediator or the marker. But I think there is a general acceptance in the field that although there are many other pathways involved in the genesis of depression, inflammation is a critical one, at least for a subset of people, at least for a subset of people. Because those uh, studies where they induced inflammation, I mean, it's interesting, some of those 
studies were, it created changes in the way people think, didn't it? Even in terms of uh, how people perceive the world. If you, uh, I've seen some of those research where they gave TNF alpha or, or lipopolysaccharides to induce inflammation, and and people would be more sensitive to criticism and social rejection and things like that. So that was fascinating work that's been done. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that they those cytokines reproduce not only the psychological stuff which you mentioned. Yep. like negative thinking, interpersonal sensitivity, um, but also the classical physical symptoms like fatigue, sleep disturbance, loss of appetite. So that implies yeah. that uh, cytokines really have an important role in the genesis of depression. Saying that, um, if you look at the biology of depression, it's actually very hard to find a system that isn't involved in depression, at least to some modest degree. So it's a yes. very complicated process. Absolutely. And so it's certainly not it's a simple kind of, uh, you know, inflammation causes depression. Um, there's obviously a whole bunch of other factors that are going on that might that complicate the picture, isn't there? Absolutely. So with inflammation, it's becoming more aware that there's a, re- a relationship between inflammation and, and mental health, and particularly, the, I suppose, the, the, the largest body of evidence is around probably depression. So does everybody with depression have inflammation? Is it what the no, research shows? Uh, absolutely mm-hmm. not. So yep. one of the problems is that um, only about a half of the people who have depression, if you look at the scatter plots of the um, you know, studies comparing controls to people who are depressed, there's huge overlap between those groups. There's, mm-hmm. The mean is clearly higher in the depression group than the control group. But if you look at the, the, the dots, the individual subjects, uh, there's huge overlap. So like many biomarkers in psychiatry, sensitivity and specificity of inflammation as a biomarker of depression is quite poor. Mm-hmm. So it's not sensitive in that a lot of depressed people don't have it. And it's not specific yeah. because a lot of people who have uh, schizophrenia, obesity, you know, PTSD will also have increased inflammation. The only evidence I'm aware of that suggests that it's associated with a specific phenotype of depression is the work of the Amsterdam Group, uh, led by Brenda Pennings. So Brenda's Mm -hmm. done some very interesting work where she's divided depression into two types, what she calls an immunometabolic depression and a cortisol-related depression. So immunometabolic depression is the depression which she links to inflammation. So these are people who tend to have uh, obesity, hyperphagia, so atypical depressive symptoms, and they have increased inflammation, whereas the group who have classical, typical depression, loss of appetite, insomnia, they tend to have more disturbance in cortisol systems. Now, um, a keen observer would step back and say, actually, both cortisol and, for that matter, inflammatory systems are both stress response systems in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us to stop thinking about inflammation purely as a bug-fighting system and rather think about cytokines and inflammation as part of a broader stress response system, which is really where much more tightly linked to the whole construct of depression. So it's not as simple as just going, okay, this person that's presenting here might be cortisol-related or cortisol-induced depression, and this one here might be inflammation-induced depression, so let's treat accordingly. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. That's the next step. That's the next step. Mm -hmm. No one's done that yet. Okay. So, so how do you determine whether somebody's more cortisol induced and somebody's more inflammatory induced? So, so you know, your, your typical markers of cortisol dysregulation, mm-hmm. uh, so elevated cortisol, loss of the diurnal rhythm, yep. abnormal dexamethasone suppression test, that's much more likely to occur in people with classical, typical melancholic pattern depression. Mm-hmm. At least according to Brenda, and I have to say her hypothesis has not yet been amply replicated externally. And then yep. atypical depression, your hypersomnia, hyperphagia, overweight, obese people are more likely to have high levels of cytokines. Um, okay. That okay. would suggest that you could use anti-cortisol treatments like RU486 in the former group, and you could be using classical anti 
inflammatory strategies in the latter group. So that's a very clear maybe that arises from that understanding, but that has to be tested in trials. Okay, all right, and that hasn't been done yet. That's at the moment oh, no, just really kind of yet. differentiating to him. Okay, because that's really what's got me initially. I remember looking at some of the studies, uh, an issue around celecoxib for the treatment of depression and when it was used as an adjunct to antidepressants, there was a study there where there was greater um, improvement in, in depressive symptoms when you use the anti-inflammatory and the antidepressant together. And then that was what really led me into kind of looking into kind of natural anti-inflammatories and curcumin and you know, we certainly can go into that later on. But uh, That's kind of triggered a whole lot of areas of interest and trialling a whole lot of different compounds with quite variable success rates. Yeah, yeah, because the, the research is not consistent, isn't it? It's not just a matter of just then, well, let's give an anti-inflammatory and uh, we're going to see improvements in, in depressive symptoms. That's not necessarily the case, is it? That is not the case. Uh, so there's an awful lot of people, um, firstly, who have depression who don't have elevated levels of inflammation. Mm-hmm. So at least in theory then, if you stratify for inflammation, you should yeah. be able to get better results. Yeah. And Two or three studies have tried to do this and failed. Um, So there's a study by Roger McIntyre and and a few others where people have tried to stratify for inflammation and see if anti-inflammatories work better. And unfortunately, that hasn't been the spectacular success that people might have hoped. Now, Mm -hmm. again, trials are complicated beasts. I always think of Uh, Tolstoy's law of clinical trials. So Tolstoy wrote, happy families are all alike. Unhappy families are all unique in their misery. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of clinical trials. So successful trials are all alike and get everything right. But unsuccessful trials can fail for any one of a million reasons. It could be that the idea you have at the get-go is wrong, but it's very common that there are methodological problems that preclude you from detecting the signal. So a negative study doesn't necessarily mean that your idea was bad. Uh, Studies can fail for many reasons. Yeah, yeah. and it's often those negative studies that they kind of lead you into more understanding and and kind of, you know, help you develop a a different study that maybe improves upon what was already kind of studied already. So not not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Although if you... If you muck up the design of a study and you end up with a negative study and it's a false negative, yeah. it can pour enough cold water in the field that nobody goes back there again because yeah, exactly. it's hard to get funding for a study when somebody says, you know, that somebody else has published on this and it was convincingly negative. Now, I just want to go back a little bit because you mentioned, obviously, there's a relationship between inflammation and mental health, but you can get then people who have so let's say, for example, high, high levels of cytokines or CRP, and then some will develop depression, others get bipolar disorder, others get schizophrenia, and what's going on there? Is there any idea about, is there, are there obviously different mechanisms going on, or is it genetics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and some will get heart to have heart attacks, and yeah. some will get diabetes, which are also in, uh, in disorders linked to inflammation. So it's really complicated, and I think there's an interplay between... uh, I think it's also important to remember that inflammation is not a disorder-specific thing. So these are Mm -hmm. ubiquitous pathways involved in regulation of signaling and defense in every bodily system and therefore are likely Mm -hmm. to play a role in almost any disease that you care to mention. So once you conceptualize these inflammatory pathways as ubiquitous life essential signaling pathways, then it becomes less reasonable to assume that you're going to find a signal specific to any one disorder. And I think that's what the evidence is now showing. So I know that obviously, you know, things like inflammation affects your HPA axis activity and can impact on neurotransmitter activity and neurotrophins and oxidative stress, so obviously the, yeah, there's that interplay between all those different mechanisms, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, and I think um, one has to accept that the body doesn't really work with one system subserving one function. It, you know, it's a bit like you can have a, a limitless number of books written using the same 26 letters of the alphabet. There's a language yes. whereby these complicated systems and processes interact at a tissue-specific level, 
that conveys a message and has a function that is unique to that system. In a different yes. context, with other partners, in a different relationship, all these signals can have entirely different meanings to a particular tissue. And that's what makes it complicated, doesn't it? You know, I remember initially reading the literature and go, oh, wow, inflammation, mental health, um, that's great. Now all we need to do is reduce inflammation and we're going to be able to, uh, you know, that's going to be the, the key. And while that certainly, yeah, you know. Everything seems so simple. Except yeah, it isn't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, so, only, so let's. I, and the only thing I'm sure about is that no matter how complicated we think it is, it's much, much more complicated than that. Absolutely. So, so let's say, okay, I'm a clinician. I'm seeing somebody with depression. Okay, they're coming into my office or, or some other mental health condition. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe inflammation has a role. We don't know necessarily whether it's a major role, but inflammation has a role. What am I looking for? Are they particular tests I'm doing? Are they, um, like well, you said, I, are they I think at this symptoms? stage of the game, we don't know enough mm-hmm. to suggest that a Jobbing clinicians seeing a real patient should be measuring inflammation and that this should guide treatment. I think it's too mm-hmm. early to do so. Uh, I would love to be able to say, oh, yeah, you should be able to measuring C-reactive protein, and if it's elevated, we should be using an anti-inflammatory strategy, and these are the ones that are evidence-based. Uh, I think the field's not there yet. A lot of people are hoping that it'll get there. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. certainly one of them, but uh, to be honest, uh, I think it's we're not quite there yet. Uh, yep. That's not to say clinicians can't think of anti-inflammatory strategy as an augmentation, um, yeah. but given this current state of play, I would say that they're pretty low down the algorithm of mm-hmm. lifestyle, psychological, and pharmacological strategies. Yep. You would have to have failed an awful lot first. Uh, yeah. I think the science is probably too early. Uh, but no. saying okay. that, there's an awful yeah. lot of people that you and I have seen who have failed 10 treatments already. Right? Mm-hmm. So in that group of patients, and they're not a small group, I think a clinician could be justified in using one. So yeah. the place that I think a jobbing clinician could think about an anti-inflammatory strategy would be this kind of scenario. So you've got a patient who's got treatment refractory depression. They've failed a bazillion things. Uh, They're overweight, they're obese, they've got an atypical pattern of depression. They smoke, they've got high blood pressure, and they're diabetic, and their cholesterol's not looking so good. You should put them on a statin. Uh, So there's already a rationale for cardiovascular prevention proactively because we know that depression is a more potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease than smoking. It's one of the most robust predictors of cardiovascular disease. So if you already have cardiovascular risk factors and your cholesterol is not looking too pretty, let's assume even it's at the margins of should I, shouldn't I treat, I would argue that because the statins are anti-inflammatory agents and we know that there's meta-analytic level of evidence that they have modest benefits for depression, you should be prescribing a statin because you've got a conventional justification for the statin plus an added psychiatric possible benefit. So that's the one scenario that I think routine prescription of an anti-inflammatory agent would be indicated Understanding that from a psychiatric point of view, statins are anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, from a cardiovascular okay. point of view, they are cholesterol-reducing agents. Okay, so you, you're using the statin potentially to treat the, the cardiovascular disease and potentially um, it might have mood-enhancing effects. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, yep. that's, that's the kind of rationale where I think today we would be in a position to say uh, that In people with depression who have other cardiovascular risk factors, we should be proactively and aggressively using statins because there's substantially increased cardiovascular risk in our patients. That's why people with schizophrenia die 10 years, 15 years younger than the general population. It's cardiovascular disease. Uh, If I had schizophrenia, I would want to take a statin anyway because 
it's cardiovascular disease that's going to make me die at age 60, not, not schizophrenia. Yep. Okay. So I think that yeah. uh, there's a, a rationale for aggressive early use of statins in cardiovascular prevention, understanding that mm-hmm. there is evident meta-analytic level of evidence that they have benefit for schizophrenia as well as for depression. Wow. I mean, obviously, for our listeners, it's not just a statin that you know, you'd be suggesting. There'd be all the lifestyle and psychological-based interventions that we need to also encourage too. So, Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're focusing on medication in our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. But as a clinical treatment, statin is not first line. First line yeah. is diet, exercise, yeah. uh, smoking cessation, all the lifestyle stuff. That, mm-hmm. if you look at the most recent Australian college guidelines, that is now, to use their wording, a non-negotiable first line, mm-hmm. which is quite remarkable. Uh, it's a yes. massive change in the way we're thinking about this because there's mm-hmm. evidence that individually exercise is a useful antidepressant agent. Smoking cessation helps mental health. Diet modification um, is uh, has evidence of having antidepressant efficacy. So if you bundle that lot together, together with the health benefits for all the highly co- comorbid and disproportionately more common medical mm-hmm. conditions that plague our patients, diabetes, yep. cardiovascular disease, stroke, the you know lifestyle is critical for all of the above. Mm-hmm. So you've got your statins and obviously, you know, you've mentioned all the lifestyle, which is in- integral and, and should be the initial part. There's also, you've done some work around other um, medications like aspirin and minocycline and as, as yeah, antidepressants absolutely. too. Now, What's the evidence showing around that? These are really complicated agents and they're all very different. So mm-hmm. minocycline is work led by Olivia Dean and minocycline is an old antibiotic. It's a tetracyclic antibiotic. Mm-hmm. But minocycline is complicated because it has many effects, one of which is anti-inflammatory. But it also has very robust effects on neurogenesis. So it's one of the agents Uh. that is the most potent triggers of new neuronal growth and development. So all of a sudden, minocycline is looking like a very interesting, potentially anti-inflammatory agent. We did work with aspirin uh, Mm -hmm. and came to a very different conclusion. Uh, what, what attracted us to aspirin is 100 milligrams of aspirin, baby aspirin, is thought of as being very well tolerated and is understood to have many additional health benefits. So when I heard that there was a study being planned to look at aspirin as a preventive agent in the elderly, the so-called mm-hmm. ASPRI study led by John McNeil, uh, we were very keen to add on depression as an endpoint and we were lucky enough to get the grant funded to do so. To cut a very long story short, aspirin failed to display benefit for any of the medical outcomes that they were interested in, from Mm -hmm. all-cause mortality to cardiovascular death to dementia. Uh, uh, And for depression, we, we were initially interested in aspirin as a preventive strategy. The reason being this was an otherwise healthy group, and we wanted to see whether aspirin prevented depression. And it spectacularly failed to do so. The, the lines were completely superimposed. It had no benefit whatsoever in the prevention of depression. Wow. But then, because the sample size was 19,114, it was at the time the biggest study ever done in psychiatry, there were enough people, or just under 2,000, who were depressed at baseline. Yep. And so we thought maybe aspirin treats these people. And not only did it not treat those people, but they actually did worse, which wow. really made us scratch our heads to think, why the hell might aspirin be doing this? And paradoxically, this cycles back to inflammation because our hypothesis, and we don't have good evidence to prove this, is that what aspirin was doing was what it's known to do as a side effect, is that it irritates the gut and it increases permeability of the gut And by increasing permeability, it allows translocation of lipopolysaccharide and other bacterial products into the circulation, and it might actually drive inflammation. That's what we suspect might be happening, but we don't know whether that's happening. But either way, 
low mm-hmm. dose aspirin is pretty much dead in the water as a therapy for depression after that study. And, and so what about pharmaceutical antidepressants, your uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and other antidepressants? Do they have anti-inflammatory effects? Yes, they do. So um, there's quite a lot of evidence, you know, pre-post administration suggesting that conventional SSRIs reduce circulating anti-inflammatory levels. Mm-hmm. What's not 100% sh- clear to me is whether this is the direct effect of the SSRIs themselves or whether this is a, a state-dependent marker such that you, dep- you have more inflammation in the depressive phase than in the euthymic phase. Yeah. And the transition to depression, it, from depression to euthymia, is lowering depressive, uh, sorry, infl- inflammatory markers. I'm not mm-hmm. completely clear that, of, of, of that. So does that mean that, uh, is there research showing that people who improve in mood, do they also have a reduction in inflammation or is it evidence yes, not kind they of... they do. And the best evidence comes from studies of electroconvulsive therapy mm-hmm. so, uh, because there's no medications involved. So yep. if you give somebody ECT and their mood improves, inflammation goes down, okay. which is really wow. interesting. Okay. And so if the inflammation doesn't go down, does that mean that they're more likely to be treatment resistant? Well, inflammation is associated with treatment resistance. Generally, okay. but not in the. Yep. I don't know that that's ever been shown in the context of ECT. Okay, so just to recap some of the things you've um, before we move into the, uh, some of the treatments, but just to recap some of the things that you've mentioned. So we've got then the, there's certainly a relationship between inflammation and depression. Not everybody with depression or, or mental health disturbances have inflammation, but you mentioned maybe around the research indicates around fifty percent of people will have some form of elevated inflammation. And then um, you mentioned that if we're looking at inflammation, uh, people who are more likely to have inflammation, they've got maybe your, your lifestyle-based you know, obesity and maybe poor sleep and, and things like that. You mentioned also that they are more likely to have atypical depression. So c- can you just recap atypical depression? What are the symptoms of atypical depression? So atypical depression, well, let me start with talking about what typical depression is. Yeah. So typical depression is, uh, you can't sleep, you can't eat. So you either got m- classical sleep disturbances, mid-terminal, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're waking up much earlier than normal and can't get back to sleep and loss of appetite, loss of weight. So that's typical or, meta- or melancholic pattern depression. Atypical is the opposite. Um, so atypical depression historically was defined as having four symptoms. They included increased appetite, increased sleep, uh, mm-hmm. rejection sensitivity, uh, and marked fatigue. Some people call this leaden paralysis. So yeah. people just felt completely exhausted and could not move. So that's atypical depression. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, um, there's a signal that atypical depression might be more common as a phenotype of bipolar than unipolar depression. Now, I don't know that anybody has... Uh, systematically studied this and certainly studied anti-inflammatory strategies differentially across the two. Uh, but that is an interesting differentiation. Wow. Okay. So so obviously anybody then presenting with that atypical depression, um, which is quite common, isn't it? It's not uh, uh, co- to it's coin not atypical. It's not at all, no. Yeah. I, so, here's one yeah. of the problems with atypical depression, right? It's ignored and missed and people don't pay attention to it. And the reason being... Mm that our conventional rating scales for depression, like the Montgomery and the Hamilton, have no items for atypical depression. So they don't measure it. So people ignore it. You know, it's the usual Mm -hmm. story. If you don't don't measure it, uh, nobody does anything about it. So uh, one of the things we did many moons ago is develop a, particularly because it's more of an issue for bipolar disorder, uh, atypical symptoms. The first person who really drew much attention to this was Phil Mitchell, and he writes about the bipolar signature, which includes a lot of atypical symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, So we developed a specific rating scale called the Bipolar Depression Rating Scale, which measures atypical symptoms uh, because most rating scales don't. And so can people get access to that rating scale? Oh, yeah, it's on the web. It's free. Okay. So just type in bipolar 
uh, rating scale? Bipolar depression rating scale. Okay. All right. So a good tool to potentially use uh, in practice if people uh, want to assess that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Um, I'll just touch on this, but I know that you also have done a lot of work on oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction and, and mental health. Uh, they obviously are the potential drivers of, um, of mood disorders. Absolutely. And they're not disconnected. So, for example, oxidative stress um, is tightly interconnected with inflammation. Uh, the drivers of inflammation and the drivers of oxidative stress are very similar. And mm. both interact very tightly with mitochondrial function. Um, infl- high levels of inflammation are amongst the most potent suppressors of mitochondrial function. And in a way, that is nature working. Because if you have an infection, the body needs to quarantine all its energy for fighting the inflammation. And if you're using that energy running marathons, you're going to die. So nature evolved to shut down mitochondrial energy generation if you've got high levels of systemic, systemic inflammation. The consequence in an inflammatory disorder like depression is you then have persistent raised inflammation and you then have persistently suppressed mitochondrial function uh, and that leads to all kinds of other problems, not only the symptoms like fatigue, um, but it also then ties into other medical disorders where mitochondrial functioning is critical, like uh, you know diabetes or cardiovascular yeah. disease. So that's got me thinking a little bit. You know, if we go out and go, okay, let's give a whole bunch of anti-inflammatories because you know, we think inflammation is going on, and and that, that potentially reduces the inflammation. And we're not treating the drivers of the inflammation. We might then be reducing inflammation and doing more harm than good because the inflammation is kind of in there as a, an adaptive response. There's something going on either lifestyle-wise or biologically-wise that we really need to identify and treat. And if we just reduce inflammation by giving all these anti-inflammatories, we might potentially be doing more harm than good. Well, that's possible. Uh, it's an entirely mm-hmm. plausible thought. Um, However, there are many examples where even though it's physiological, uh, there, there's clinical benefit in doing so. So we give people who've got infections Panadol because it reduces symptoms and people feel better and there's no deleterious consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right in as much as if the inflammation is coming from physical inactivity, smoking, obesity, poor diet, an inflammatory diet, then yes, you'd imagine that the deleterious effects of those lifestyle behaviors may well not be compensated by simply taking a pill. Yeah, and that's really where that personalized care comes into place. We obviously need to really uh, do a good assessment and really go, okay, well, what's going on for this individual? Whether inflammation's going on or not, what's... What are the potential drivers of this person's low mood? Is it uh, poor sleep? Is it a physical inactivity? Is it diet related? And uh, we really need to kind of target those areas, don't we? Absolutely, which is why I agree with the college guidelines that lifestyle modification should be routine in the work that we do. And it doesn't have to be dramatic or Mm -hmm. overly comprehensive. If you can convey to people just the advice that, you know, Mr. Smith, your smoking might be contributing to your depression, and there's good evidence that quitting smoking is going to improve your mental health. So instead of thinking about smoking in the too hard basket, you should be thinking about smoking as low-hanging fruit Mm -hmm. and really trying to quit. And there was a misperception many moons back Mm -hmm. that people with psychiatric disorders are less likely to quit. That is not the case. Uh, So we need to be doing this and we need to be giving that kind of routine counseling, similarly around physical activity, similarly around diet. Again, the rules around diet don't have to be complicated. They can be really simple. Certainly. And obviously when they're feeling depressed and motivated and, and fatigued, you know, complicating it can make them feel worse potentially. So we really need to be aware of where they're at and, and ensure that the treatment recommendations we offer are reasonable for them. So, 
You just may, I'll just also go back. You mentioned kind of smoking. This is what I was kind of alluding to before was like you got somebody smoking and they go, Mr. Smith, you're smoking, so therefore we know that that can cause oxidative stress. So here is a whole bunch of antioxidants to uh, combat your smoking, the, the, the damaging effects of your smoking. We've really got to be careful about doing that, don't we? Well, I think there's almost no evidence that that kind of strategy is helpful. Yeah, exactly. Are you able to kind of tell me, I know you've done a lot of, on N-acetylcysteine and yeah, can you tell me a bit about the NAC, the N-acetylcysteine work that you've done and what, what the research is saying about that? Well, we came to N-acetylcysteine. We were working with Ashley Bush at the Flory at the time and there was a pa- paper came out by Kim Doe from Lausanne in Switzerland which said that people with schizophrenia had dramatically lowered levels of glutathione in their brains. So glutathione is the brain's major antioxidant. And N-acetylcysteine is the juice that replenishes glutathione. So we thought, well, there's a simple solution to a complex problem. Let's give them NAC. Uh, And we did a trial in schizophrenia, and we showed significant but modest benefits in uh, schizophrenia, particularly negative symptoms. But it took an awful long time for that to work. So uh, it was really only significant Mm -hmm. uh, at the six-month time point. Um, And since then, a number of studies have come out, Uh, some of them negative, some of them positive, Um, but reassuringly, more recent meta-analyses of the just over half a dozen studies are out there suggest that it is effective. Uh, And just yesterday, a network meta-analysis came out of nutraceuticals Mm -hmm. for schizophrenia. Um, suggesting that NAC was the most effective nutraceutical for the treatment of schizophrenia, which is kind of heartening. Uh, I also have to say, uh, caveat with NAC, that it is very slow to work. Uh, We're Mm -hmm. looking at six months before you really notice anything. And the effect sizes are modest. You're not looking, it's no clozapine. It's not going to take somebody, uh, it's not a a cure-all, but yeah. In people with significant schizophrenia, particularly in negative symptoms, um, it does offer modest benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's better than you get from most other therapies, which do not work, particularly for negative symptoms. There are really no good treatments for negative symptoms. So I still think it's useful to the field. What was the dosage that, you're, that you use for NAC? So we use two grams a day. Uh, other mm-hmm. studies have gone up a bit. They've used, some have used three, some have used 2.4. But that's kind of the ballpark where most people are sitting at. So NAC potentially for schizophrenia. What's the research say around depression and bipolar? Uh, so again, there are now about a half a dozen studies of bipolar disorder as well. Um, some of those studies, our initial study was quite robustly positive. More recent mm-hmm. studies, including studies we've been involved in, have not been positive. Um, but meta-analyses have been variable. So depending on which studies you put in and how you do your maths, they are positive and they are negative meta-analyses. So the story of bipolar depression is probably a little bit more uncertain. Mm-hmm. But again, probably you get modest benefit and again, probably with extended periods of treatment. But the, the bipolar story is a little bit more uncertain than the schizophrenia okay. story. All right, so it certainly needs to be uh, used on a if, – if it's going to work, it seems like it needs to be used on a longer-term basis and around that one to uh, two-gram level. Two grams. And, you know, the, the advice is you don't look at the speedometer until you've hit six months. Yeah, uh, you okay. really can't assess for a, an awful long time. Does it ha- impact on the manic phase or is it more the depressive symptoms? Nobody's done a trial in mania. So we've looked okay. in our original depression study, we've done subgroup analyses post hoc, uh, at manic mm-hmm. symptoms. And at least post hoc, there was a reduction in YMRS scores, the paper by Pedro Mahalez. Uh, but nobody's looked at mania that I'm aware of. And I know NAC, there was um, studies initially with OCD, wasn't there, with the NAC, with obsessive compulsive Correct. disorder? So there are a number of studies in OCD. One of them was led by uh, Jerome Saracen, colleague at the Melbourne Clinic. Uh, but there are half a dozen uh, OCD studies Studies. And the picture is really similar uh, in as much as that there's a modest benefit, 
interestingly, in obsessions, not compulsions. Uh, and that's useful because behavior therapy targets compulsions, not obsessions. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, yeah. again, the, the benefits, if they are there, because the data is soft, are mm -hmm. relatively modest. But the advantage that NAC has is its tolerability and safety appears to be pretty good. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at NAC as an adjunct to you know, response prevention therapy or psychological therapy. That'd be interesting to see whether it adds anything. Oh, absolutely. There's so many things one could look at. Yeah, absolutely. What the research then and our clinical experience indicates that really we need to really look at you know, what factors are driving a person's mental health disturbances and, and obviously lifestyle-based factors and sleep hygiene and diet and, and exercise and obviously social connections and being outdoor in, outside in nature. I mean, they're the things that really we need to be targeting. Oh, absolutely. That's a really biggie. Yeah, and they're the things that I think, you know, we, we're definitely going to get some benefit there with, uh, with our clients if we really target those areas for sure. So, Michael, thank you very much for joining us today to talk about inflammation and how it affects mental health. It's really no wonder that so many of these disorders are on the rise, but at least we have people like you out there doing the important research on lifestyle, dietary and nutraceutical options that can be employed to um, lower inflammation and possibly improve mental health. Uh, you've, today you've provided us with lots of great information about treatment options that our listeners will definitely appreciate. So thank you for all of that and allocating some time today to be with us today. Absolute pleasure, Adrian. Thanks for chatting. And thanks, everyone, for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts, and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Adrian Lopresti, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hi, this is Dr. Damien Christoph. Join us on FX Medicine next week where I'll be talking to Ben Southam about all things exercise physiology and how it integrates into your patient's care. Subscribe to us on your favourite podcast app and follow us on social media to make sure you never miss an episode.